when you've directed a movie. What was it like seeing Mulan out in the wild with a completely just a whole civilian crowd? They had no animators in there. <clears throat> what was that like? What was that feeling? That like? was um, nerve wracking. I yeah. would say it was probably the first thing I would think of because we're, one of our very first screenings was, uh, and you know, after the movie comes out, you do what's called a press junket and you take the movie around and you let press see it from different territories. So we had a, um, one of our first press tours was, um, yeah, in the United States, we did one, but we took it to China and our most nervous screening was in Hong Kong because this was the first time that a true Chinese audience was gonna be seeing what we, these Westerners, these white guys, made out of this Chinese girl's tale, which is beloved. You know, the story of Mulan is a beloved tale um, in China. And it's that's really her, you know, China's daughter, really, yeah. in a lot of ways. So they really, it's it's valuable to them. It's impactful for them. They hand it down as a, a, a kind of a moral lesson to kids in school. They, they've done songs about Mulan. I mean, you name it. Um, we saw statues to Mulan in China. So to play it for them, we just thought, oh my gosh, they're going to, what if they stone us? You know, what if, what, what if they send us to jail or they don't let us leave the country without torturing us first? I don't know. I mean, we were just like, you know, this could really go poorly. You know, we have no idea at that point what people are going to think from China. Yeah. Um, thankfully, it, it ended well. The, the, the lights came up and there was a huge response after the movie was over. But during the movie... We were like, uh, oh, here comes a funny part, and they wouldn't they wouldn't respond because they were they're not really too vocal in China at the time anyway. When they would see funny parts in movies, they wouldn't respond very much. You know, um, they weren't. It wasn't. It just wasn't like a U.S. audience where we we're more vocal about things and stuff. Um, so we didn't know how it was going to go until the lights came up, and then there was big applause. You know, and we yeah. could tell that they really liked it. And um, and since then, that's been the best really kind of most gratifying um, audience and people that have said that they've liked the movie has been Chinese. I have a, a pastor at my church uh, who is uh, 100% Chinese. Um, and he told me once, uh, uh, kind of took me aside and said, I, I have to tell you that Mulan was hugely impactful for me in my relationship with my father. Um, and that meant a lot to me. But I've also, I remember at an early screening, a father of a daughter came up to me and he says, I didn't think I would ever have um, because of Chinese culture and that kind of feeling of you can't really hug your kids or show a lot of affection. He says, I didn't know that I'd be able to ever enjoy, you know, um, <clears throat> a very emotional connection with my daughter until I took her to go see Mulan. And after that, I felt a freedom to, to hug my daughter. And he says, wow we've been hugging, uh, you know, our, the rest of our lives. And, and I said, he said, I, I have a different relationship, a better relationship with my daughter because of Mulan. So thank you. And he was crying. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so things like that are like, whoa, you just don't know. You just don't know when you're making these films, how they're going to impact anyone, let alone the world or have a cultural impact. It's just to this day, it's very surreal. I got to tell you, Justin, it's very surreal. Hey guys, it's your host Julian. This week I sit down with legendary Disney animator Tony Bancroft. Tony was the co-director for Mulan, so this episode is pretty Mulan-centric. We also talk about his love for animation, his amazing podcast with his twin brother Tom, his time working at Disney, and so much more. If you like my podcast, I guarantee you're going to love Tom and Tony's. You can find that podcast wherever you find podcasts at by searching the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast. Don't forget, if you're liking what we're doing here, leave us a five-star rating, and I hope you enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's in My Head podcast. I'm your host, Julian. Today, I'm joined by one half of the dynamic twin duo from Disney, Mr. Tony Bancroft. Tony, how are you, sir? Hey, you got the better of the twins, too. Good for you. <laughs> That's one of, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you like this podcast, you're going to love Tony and Tom's podcast. It is the best podcast in animation. And I've pulled from you guys' catalog as far as, you guys have inspired me so much just from the animation side. And then when wow. I started doing this podcast, I found you guys' podcast. And I absolutely love what you guys do. And I love the banter and the sibling rivalry that you guys have. <laughs> it makes it so damn fun. 
It so. is. Uh, it's very natural for us. We're highly tell. competitive uh, with our animation, with our art. Um, we've definitely dealt with nepotism our whole career. So when you put all those things together, it adds for some, you know, family fun dynamics in the world of animation. Absolutely, man. And before we dive deep into your career, man, there is one thing I've always wanted to know. You always see it in TV with twins. Have you guys ever had to switch or tried to switch? And if you did, how far did you get with switching? <laughs> yeah, we did that. You know, it's there's certain things that you kind of got to do uh, when you're twins. You got to answer the question of, did you ever have a secret language when you were kids? Nope. Uh, although my, my mom says we did. We said we used to goo goo gaga, I guess, and understand each other. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, are you telepathic or do you feel the other's feelings? Nope. Never happened. Um, and then the other one was like, have you ever switched places? Right. And uh, we have in high school just to do it because everybody used to ask us all the time. So we did it in one class. The teachers were totally confused, never, uh, never knew that there was a change, but all the other students in our class did, and they knew us right off the bat. They're like, oh my gosh, Tony, what are you doing here instead of Tom? You know, and, and uh, they were onto it. So it just goes to show you that even if you're identical twins, if somebody really knows you, if you have friends, you know, they really get to see the differences, the subtleties, and they know immediately. Yeah. Well. Like I said, man, uh, I'm really enjoying this. I've been looking forward to this one for quite some time. I look forward to all my guests, but this one in particular, man. Uh, so Thanks. taking it back, I don't know. Do you ever game back in the day? Have you ever been a video game type of guy? I, you know, I started getting involved with, um, with video games when I, when I was first starting at Disney and I had to give it up. I had to give it up because I started getting too intense and um, uh, addicted to it. And uh, I was working on Emperor's New Groove, I remember, and I started kind of settling back and getting the doom had just come out like the early, early doom. Mm -hmm. um, and I was getting addicted to it and I, my scenes were not getting done. So uh, Emperor's New Groove would not have finished if I didn't throw that away. So I did. <laughs> That's fantastic, man. The only reason I bring that up is because I met one of my closest friends because of your little movie and, and a little movie, I mean, that completely is a sarcastic point, but your big movie really was Mulan, right? So to yeah. this day, I think Mulan has the greatest soundtrack of any Disney movie. That's just my personal favorite. Mm. Um, and what I would do is when I was about 10 years ago, I would play this little game called World of Warcraft, right? Huge time suck. It took away from everything, right? But I got to meet some of my yeah. closest friends from it. And what we would do is we would throw it in guild recruitment and we would use like just funny sayings or funny words or funny paragraphs to kind of get people to click on and say, oh, I, I wonder what this guy's about. And I used um, I used a, a Mulan a Mulan song, and for the life of me, I can't think of it. I'll make a man out of you. Uh, that's what I was using. Yeah. So we were using lyrics from that one, and then we had the entire looking for group, looking for guild chat, and this is millions of players now at this point, just rattling off a sentence for each one. So we 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 did our part in trying to make Mulan trend through World of Warcraft, man. And because of that, like I said, I got to meet <laughs> one of my coolest friends and one of my deepest friends, uh, longest friends, Hunter Fuller. Um, so thank you for that, Tony. But I love this oh. movie. Mulan is one of those movies that you can watch no matter what part of that movie is on. I'm sitting down and watching it. I love the beginning, the middle, the end. Uh, but I got to imagine with you being so young when you took that over. I think when I had John on, he said you were 27. Is that correct? Yeah, 27. Yeah. When I became a director on Mulan. At what point did you say, oh, my God, I'm going to shit my pants. I'm 27 years old. This is Walt Disney World. They handed me my, my first directing film. Uh, I mean, what was that initial call like? How did you find out? Yeah, I mean, you can imagine. I mean, it was pretty horrifying and exciting at the same time, probably like equal parts. For, fortunately, Tom and I grew up with a mom, a single, single parent mom that raised us with uh, a lot of confidence and a lot of um, she used to tell us all the time. You know, if a door of opportunity opens, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Go through it and just see what happens. You know, you might fall flat on, flat on your face or something, but at least you tried. It's better to try than to live with regret. And I've always used that as uh, kind of foundational in my life and, and good sense. Uh, same with Tom also. Um, and so, yeah, how it came about was... Um, I had finished Lion King and Lion King was a really good experience for me. I was a young animator, one of the youngest supervising animators on a Disney film also. 
having done uh, Pumbaa, the Warthog and the Lion King. And um, it's funny because uh, it was just uh, serendipitous really that this happened, but it was the director of, of uh, Lion King, Rob Minkoff, who was walking out you know, one night to the parking lot with, this is the story I heard years later, he was walking out to the parking lot with one of the big executives at Disney who was searching for um, a partner to somebody to plug in with Barry Cook, who was already on Mulan, which was like the legend of Mulan back then. It had a different name and or Fa Mulan. Yeah. Legend of Fa Mulan. Very long name. Uh, <clears throat> um, and uh, he was walking out uh, to the parking garage with Rob Minkoff and he says, Rob, you know, we're looking for and Rob was like the golden boy because Lion King had come out and done so well. Um, so he's like, you know, what do you think? You know, give me your two cents. And who do you think could direct with Barry Cook on Mulan? And he's like, well, Tony Bancroft, who did Pumbaa on The Lion King. Um, you know, he's, I know he wants to be a director. And fast, and, you know, and, and going back in time, five years before that, as I was an in-betweener on uh, Roller Coaster Rabbit that Rob Minkoff also directed, it was his first directorial debut. Um, we were talking one night and just getting to know each other. And he asked me like, what do you want to do ultimately? And I'm like, and I'm just like this snotty nosed kid at Disney just starting. I was in my first six months of being at the studio. And I told him one day I want to direct just like you. I want to be just like you, Rob, you know, and, um, and he remembered that. And so, you know, five years later, after me working with him on Lion King and doing this other stuff that I'd done, like I'm Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin, and then making that comment to, um, you know, this Disney executive that set it in motion. Like I was nowhere on the radar for that film and I shouldn't have been, um, but it wasn't until Rob recommended me. And then um, they started kicking around the idea. And, and I heard the executive talk to other producers and, and things like that. And everybody kind of spoke well of me and I got asked, I got asked to come on. And when I thought, when I got called into this executive's office, it was on a Friday, and I really, told, I told my wife that morning, I said, this is either one of two things, babe. I'm either getting fired or promoted. But I, I had no reason to think that either one was justified at that moment. So I was totally perplexed. And thankfully, it went the right way. How long were you running on that high of being announced as the co-director for Mulan? I got to imagine the parties were running pretty deep at the Bancroft house, but uh, what, yeah. was that, what was that initial like, oh, wow, I, this is happening? We had to keep it a secret for a while, you know, while I, you know, because it meant a new contract and all this kind of stuff. So I had to get an attorney. And so there was a duration of a couple of weeks where I had to be quiet and not tell anybody. But I did tell my brother because my twin brother, Tom, who you guys know from the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast, mm -hmm. he was already assigned to, in Florida, it was a Florida project, and I was in Burbank, California at the time, and Florida was already uh, developing Mulan with Barry Cook, my co-director, who started on it before me. So Tom was already assigned to it. He was developing some of the characters, doing animation tests of Mushu. He really wanted to get on that character. And um I did, uh, even though I said I wasn't going to tell anybody about it um, because they didn't want to announce it yet, um, I did talk, talk to Tom. He was the first person I went to. And I said, dude, this is your film. You're on it first. I've been given this opportunity. They've asked me to come on and co-direct. I want to do it, but I want to make sure you're okay with it. You know, and I, because I didn't want to ruin anything for him. And I knew that the whole nepotism thing was going to be an issue. I knew that there was going to be ripple effects for him mm -hmm. um and it meant you know i was going to go back to florida i started there left for burbank and now i was going to go back again so i was going to definitely be in his space and for the first time when we separated after i left florida uh, to go out um and animate it for disney and burbank that was the first time that we had been separated i mean like since birth practically i mean we went to school together we always shared rooms together and so so he got married and I went to Burbank, California, and that really was the first time we were apart for several years until I got Mulan. And now I'm going to be coming back into his world. And I just wanted to make sure that he was cool with that, which he was. He was like, oh, you got to take this, you know, just like mom said, you got to, it's a door that opened up. You got to do it. Absolutely. And there's two things I wanted to circle back to. Uh, I'm actually, I'm from Orlando, Florida. I live in Orlando, Florida. Um, it's an interesting, you've lived here before, so it's an interesting place to live. 
yeah. but uh, I can't remember who it was. It might have been Aaron Blaze or it might have been John, but uh, I heard a story somewhere. It might have actually been your podcast. Um, but uh, what was the name of that podcast again that you and uh, Tom do? <laughs> the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast. That's yeah. the one. Ladies and gentlemen, like I said, you got to check that one out. Um, but uh I think you guys had talked about your favorite watering holes or your favorite place to go, or it might've just been, you know, something I saw in an interview, but uh, taking a step back, where were some of your favorite places to go to in the Orlando area? I mean, yeah, there was a watering hole that a lot of Disney employees went to called the big bamboo. Mm -hmm. And we actually showcased that as a, it, it, it's really kind of a hidden Mickey kind of thing, a trivia piece that um, uh, the, the rocket that, um, uh, at the end of the film, the rocket that Mushu straps to his back and he gets shot towards um, Sean Yu and ult ultimately blows up Sean Yu in the fireworks yeah. a tower. Um, it has uh, Chinese writing on it and, and in, in English that that means the big bamboo. So yeah. that rocket had um, had all the, you know, the the love and angst of, of people's love and joy for Disney as employees flying straight at Tishan Yu into a big bloody mess. <laughs> so we kind of enjoyed that. It was because the Big Bamboo is one of those places that um, it was usually uh, disgruntled employees went there. They used to say that um, that employees that got fired from Disney would go yeah. there and get like drunk and, you know, raging drunk. Yeah. And that, that's where they would leave their name tags uh, on their last day. Oh, and that's cool. True that, it had a whole wall of Disney name tags all over this wall, the big bamboo. So it was very much a, you know, a, an employees only kind of uh, hangout place. And a lot of our story people, Chris Sanders and John Sanford, and even more uh, used to hang out at the big bamboo all the time. That's really cool. And now that you brought up those two, it might've been one of those two, cause I had Chris on not too long ago. I I've, there's a couple people that I've had on here that have made me tired in the best possible way. I've never met somebody, you know, via zoom that has the energy that Chris has all the time. It's just go, 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 go. And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm smiling from ear to ear because Lilo and stitch was actually, you know, my mom's still around, but m the last movie my mom took us to as, as like kids was Lilo and stitch. That was like a whole, that was like the last time uh, all of my sisters and brothers and my mom, went to a movie together, you know, when we were still young and it was, it's still one of those ones that's like, it'll never leave. There'll be so many things that I forget as yeah. I get older, but that's one of those moments that is just, what was it? Uh, inside out, not inside out. Yeah. Inside out where that's that core memory, right? It'll never disappear. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. you know, like I said, Lilo and Stitch and like I said, Chris Sanders, man, he was, he was just boom, 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 boom. And the fact that he can recollect so much right off the top of his head is like, dude, you're, I'd, I need to start writing stuff down because you've thrown out like 20 or 30 different facts that I need to go and check and, and, and read into this. So he was a really cool guest, man. But the other thing I wanted to circle back to was when you and Tom had split and you said that was the first time you guys had been away from each other since birth. Uh, did it feel weird? I mean, not in the sense that you guys are identical twins, but you guys were there day in and day out for so many years. Did it feel different? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, we, there was so many things, and this is kind of a, a, a real twin thing, obviously, for the listeners out there that are twins, they'll connect. But um, yeah, our, our identities were so intertwined by that point. Um, like when we went to Cal Arts together and we were studying animation and, you know, Disney came calling looking for interns for a new internship. We both got in. I mean, it was almost like, well, of course, we're both going to go to Florida and we're both going to get in this internship. And um, we never really thought about the, the outcome that maybe one of us was better and, and Disney was not going to take the other one. Um, oh my gosh, that would have been crushing for either one of us, I think. But thankfully, yeah, we, we kind of were always intertwined and it wasn't until that point where we chose to separate. I chose to go back to California after being at Florida for about a year um, and he stayed and got married and all that. And then I, I went back and fell in love and got married the year later, but stayed in California. Um, uh, yeah. So it was that, it was that transition that was, it was very surreal, you know, thinking about like, how do I, how do I see myself without Tom? Just simple things, you know, like who am I without my twin brother when he's not around, mm -hmm. you know, it was such a, kind of awakening and learning uh, kind of transition for both of us. Yeah. But we really grew in, we craved it too. We wanted to have that individuality because so much of our life 
we were just the Bancrofts or Twinners or whatever people would call us and or make fun of us with. Um, <laughs> you know, so it was uh, it was a it was a good thing. It needed to happen, and I think that's when I really came into my own in a lot of ways and became a director and. And at the same time, we're working at Disney, but 3,000 miles apart, you know, so we were very, very much still connected with um, everything that we loved and everything that we were doing. We worked on the same films, but 3,000 miles apart, you know, so we would call each other all the time and talk about the scenes that we were doing or, or some of the studio gossip, you know, and he just gave me the Florida perspective and I gave him the Burbank perspective. Yeah. Do you like Nickelodeon? Do you like whiskey or whiskey cocktails? Then you should hang out with us. I'm Ty. I'm Sean. And we run Whiskey Lodeon, the podcast. Ty, what is this podcast about? It's where we drink whiskey or whiskey cocktails while rewatching the old school Nickelodeon shows we loved growing up. And let's be honest, we go on a lot of tangents. So many tangents. Are we on a tangent right now? Yeah, I think so. Oh my gosh. Well, we got to get back. We are covering Rugrats. Hey, Arnold, are you afraid of the dark? All the golden greats of Nickelodeon. And these shows give us so much joy. And we want to bring you that same joy. So find us wherever you get your podcast at Whiskey Lodeon. And I got to cut you off right now because we honestly cannot afford any more ad space and it really just kind of has to end right. That's pretty cool, man. Thank you for sharing that. Like I said, it's it's always interesting because growing up, you know, obviously you've got a brother, so it, it's civil rivalry. There was only one or two times where it was like a complete ceasefire in my house, with my younger brother, because we're about 18 months, give or take uh, apart. Um, so when we're growing up, obviously cartoon network is like my lifeblood, man. When it comes to that, that is my network. I grew up right when that Renaissance was hitting for, it started with Disney and then it rolled into cartoon network from Gendy and Craig, which you guys just had Gendy on not too long. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a fantastic, that is my, what everybody looks at as far as Gendy goes. Like, so what Gendy is to me is what most things are Walt Disney, Tex Avery, you know, Chuck Jones, that's what the Gendy is to me. You know, so seeing his evolution from all of this stuff, and then, like I said, going into Craig McCracken, going into John Dilworth from Courage the Cowardly Dog and Van Partible for Johnny Bravo is just, it was just this boom, right? So that was my yeah. love of animation. Do you remember where your love of animation started? Do you remember looking at it differently? Uh, yeah, you know, for the longest time, uh, and I've told this story before, but for the longest time, Tom and I grew up with comic strips. It wasn't animation at all. And the animation in the 80s, I mean, that's how old we are. But when we were kids, it was the 80s. And it was like horrible Hanna-Barbera Saturday morning cartoons that were not great quality. And then Disney was in kind of a, this is before the like the 90s renaissance for them, the golden, what they call the second golden age. And um, so Disney was not doing great. It was like, you know, films like, I don't know, Black uh, Black Cauldron and um, things like that coming out uh, at the time when we were young. So we weren't going to the movie theater to see Disney films all the time. It wasn't the rage that it became later. Um, so it wasn't until, um, actually one of my first big influences was probably the video game. Um, and it's funny because I'm friends with John Pomeroy now, but um, Space Ace and uh, Dragon's Lair and those video games. I remember loving the animation in that because I was already really into cartooning and drawing all the time. But animation just seemed so foreign to me. It seemed so far away. Like, I, I didn't know how to figure that out. Like, there must have been some math involved. How, how do they figure out how to move those things? And, you know, we were in the still drawings and cartoons. So uh, we thought we were going to do comic strips for the rest of our lives. And I didn't discover animation until later. But that was one of those first influences. That and um, uh, Will Vinton, uh, who was doing clay animation at the time. He's, he's now long past or, you know, he passed a while ago. But uh, Will Venton was the guy that did those like raisin commercials, if you remember those, you know, yeah, Herbie, Grapevine, yeah, and um, and all kinds of clay animation. He kind of really uh, uh, trademarked that that expression, clay animation. So um, he was a big influence on us early on, you know, the commercials and all that. And uh, it wasn't until later when we were in, uh, like going to a a small uh, college city college that we met a guy that was doing these cool clay animated little shorts and we ended up making a short with him over the summer and that just we just like ignited it was like a, a bulb a huge light bulb went off for both tom and i and we just said oh it's we you know if we can do this with clay we can do this with the drawings that we're already doing we got to figure this out and so went to cal arts and the whole thing 
Yeah, uh, I think that was the guy. I, I'm pretty sure you, you know, running in the animation circle, you've probably met him a few times. You guys might even be friends, but uh, Craig Bartlett, man, the creator of Hey Arnold, I believe that was like one of his biggest influencers or, or his mentor, uh, uh, the, the guy. Oh, you, yeah, I believe so. I, I, I know I've heard that name before, but I think that's kind of where it's linked to, man. But uh, yeah, that, be, that's, yeah, yeah. Um, with with you guys both going to CalArts, and I've heard I've heard the stories about you guys. I think it was the Jorge Gutierrez episode you had on another another amazing individual right there. Oh, um, yeah. and you guys were talking about the portfolio um, when you guys would bring in your portfolios, and they would go through them and look through them and tell you what you what you really needed to focus on and and change and stuff like that. Who had the better portfolio? And this isn't a sibling yeah. rivalry question, but who had the better portfolio when you're going through CalArts? You were Tom. I, it's a great question. I mean, I, you know, I can only answer this from my point of view, but I probably thought it was Tom's. I, I mean, I think in a large way, I think Tom has always drawn better than me. We've had, we've had certain kind of moments in time where we've, one of us has surged ahead a little bit and then the other one levels up and, you know, it has been kind of up and down and competitive that way. But, um, Certainly in, in our professional life, I would say Tom surged ahead a long time ago, around the time that we, P Pocahontas came out, because he worked on that. And, and his drawing uh, skills just went through the roof when he was working with Glenn Keane on Pocahontas. And um, I feel like I've always been playing catch up since then. Yeah. But um, And only because I feel that way, I would have to say that probably Tom's was better at the time. But, you know, like I said before, I we just never considered that maybe one of us wouldn't make it in Cal arts or, you know, we were so equally yoked and just felt so uh, uh, connected in our love and desire for it. We pushed each other the same and we worked as hard as the other guy. And, you know, um, so I think we both felt pretty confident in our portfolios, but it was more like, well, if they don't accept one portfolio, they're not going to accept the other one because they're pretty close. And, so we're we're probably not going to make it into Cal Arts, and then when we both got accepted, it was like, bang, <laughs> you know, uh, it was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this, and we were so excited. Oh, that's awesome, man! Uh, and like I said, this this podcast is called the What's in My Head because we're going to jump all over the place, man. I want to make sure we hit a little bit of everything for the fans. Yeah. Out there. Um, but you know, circling back to 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 Mulan. What was that first day like for you? I mean, I got to imagine you're pretty nervous going in there. And you'd said that all of the people would start talking and coming together and everything like that. I'm pretty sure that happened down the road. But do you remember that first day? As Tom, yeah. Tom the, and so I told you they kept it pretty secret for a while. Mm -hmm. and um, But it started to leak out a little bit. And so before it went too broad... I remember uh, in the Burbank studio, uh, this is not Florida, but in the Burbank studio, we were already, uh, um, sorry, not we, but um, Barry Cook and the story team. There was a development team. They were doing visual development and all kinds of character design stuff. There was a team in Burbank already working on the film. And there was a team in Florida doing some development stuff. But the most of the main stuff was happening in Burbank. So Chris Sanders was already on. He had just started before me um, as the head of story on Mulan. I think John Sanford was already assigned to it. And then they had about six other storyboard artists there. They had an editor and, you know, producer and that's that, you know, so there was a, a good, I would say 25, 30 people on the Burbank crew. And what we did, what they did was we all met in the, the Burbank studios. There was a big conference room. And I remember everybody was sitting around this big conference table and they got there first and then they brought me in as a way of introducing me and i just remember being so nervous that first moment walking in there and seeing chris sanders who i already idolized he was a general you know he's like you know 10 years older than me so he was like you know on lion king and he was already an art director and i just you know i loved everything that he did and and then and then everybody everybody just felt like they even though none of them had been on there more than maybe six months um, there was still this feeling of like, this is their film and I'm coming in. And I guess I wanted to put their minds at ease that I think they all felt like, oh, Tony's coming in and he's going to change everything. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when new directors come on projects, right? And so that was one of the main things that I wanted to say is like, hey, I'm really happy with where things are going. I, I've read the script. I've seen a lot of the storyboards already. 
I've had conversations with Barry Cook already, and I'm really just here to, you know, um, come and support Barry and the vision that's already out there for Mulan. Um, and I don't think anybody bought that. I, I don't, <laughs> I felt like everybody was just like hate staring me. It was not a warm welcome. Um, and, and there was a lot of people that just felt I was way too young. You know, I mean, at 27, I was, I was way too young compared to every other director that had ever gone before. There was a certain level of nurturing and experience and, uh, 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 you know, um, just nurturing them into a position of where they could feel confident as a director. And here I am, I still felt like my, my, my voice was squeaky and stuff, you know, like, you know, am I... <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just felt like so out of place and so nervous at that moment when I saw the staff for the first time, all those great creatives. That was the hardest, the absolute hardest moment. Now, you brought up, you know, 27 being too young. At least you thought it was, right? But you, yeah. you guys, you and Barry Cook absolutely knocked it out of the park. There was a lot of people that had uh, a lot of work put into it as well. But I mean, you guys, it, it really starts at the top and then it filters down to everybody below as well, man. So I work in the restaurant industry. You know, I went from organized prison, which is military, to working in a kitchen, which is like a brigade, which is like prison. You just get it's like work release more than anything. I don't know if you've ever worked <laughs> in the kitchen before. You get to go home at the end of the night. But I mean, uh, yeah. so it's, it's structure. But I've noticed like when I work for good people and I work for horrible people, man, the, the people at top really set the pace for everybody. They set the example. And everybody kind of falls in line or they, you know, they get out. Um, but, you know, going back to your age for just a second, and this is a hypothetical question. Tony now takes over Mulan, right? Mm -hmm. If you go back in time. You get a Doc Brown's DeLorean. You go back in time. Yeah. Take this movie over. Knowing what you know now, would you change anything that you did at 27? I mean, probably. I would, I think I would, I should have been, and I wish I was maybe a little bit more open about what I didn't know. I think I came in thinking like, I got to act like I know what's going on, even though I'm dying inside or, I, or there's so many questions that I have about, this or that. And then on top of that, so there's that element, I wish I, you know, would have admitted more what I didn't know. And I think that would have been okay, and probably made me more welcoming to the, the crew. But also, um, there was a lot of times too, that I was overthinking myself. And because I wasn't confident enough in my abilities and experience, that I would sit in uh, story pitches by John Sanford, or by, you know, Chris Sanders, and I got all these ideas. I had like, oh, oh, that's a neat idea. I, I would see what they're presenting and come up with ideas to plus it or, you know, but I would hold on to it and I would let somebody else, oh, Barry said it. Barry said what I was going to say or, oh, Chris said what I was going to say. And I would kick myself at the end of the day going, why didn't I just say what I knew? I felt, you know, I think I had, you know, instincts of, story and of what I wanted and yet I didn't say it for the longest time there was I was holding myself back um out of fear you know fear of being caught as oh he's an idiot he's just stupid yeah. his ideas are bad all those negative things that I was thinking and um so at first I felt like I was really taking a back seat too long and and uh and it, and it took me a little while just to kind of mature to a point of like one going Somebody asked me a question. I don't know. I don't know. Let's, but let's, but I'll help find that answer or let's look into that together. And then the second thing is just, you know, I do have good ideas. I need to give myself some credit. I need to just step in and do my job, mm -hmm. um, which I did. I came to that, but I think in the beginning, I struggled with that quite a bit. What would you do as far as stress release for you doing during this process or during this project for Mulan? Um, my brother and I, I didn't have, you know, I went from working at that studio as kind of the lowest of the low, you know, in-betweener, assistant animator kind of thing, uh, underneath Mark Henn and all these other people. And I was equal to a lot of those people that now I was in charge of all of them and I was everybody's boss. So all my friends that were like in-betweeners with me when I was there five years before, now I'm their boss and I couldn't hang out with them anymore. It was, I'd really lost that ability to connect. They saw me as something else. They saw me as the boss and except for my brother. Um, 
I was his boss, but we were also, you know, way before all that, we were brothers. Yeah. And so he was like the only one I could hang out with uh, on my lunch break. So if I wasn't in a meeting or getting together with the, the producer or, the, or, 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 or uh, Barry, the other director, I would hole up in my office and watch a movie with Tom. We would have, you know, a burrito or something. And I would just relish the hour that we had, you know, together, just hanging out and being brothers and, and watching a movie. We were constantly popping in VHS tapes and watching this movie or that movie. Um, and, uh, and that was my release. That was like escapism for me. How isolated did you feel during this process? Probably very. I mean, I, we were in Florida. And like I said, it was, it was not like the first time we were in Florida when we were all on this. Uh, I was with par- peers and, you know, we, our, our families were hanging out. Now as the director and being on, in a different schedule and different responsibility level, um, even on the weekends and stuff, you know, my, my wife wasn't connecting anymore with the girlfriends that she had once before. Um, our schedule is totally different. She's starting to have babies and things like that. And while I'm working long hours, it became our, our, our social life was almost non-existent. Our date life was non-existent, you know, young kids and on top of it, this, you know, hugely responsible, big budget film that I'm in charge of. Um, it felt isolating. It felt isolating. It felt um, stressful, you know, constantly. Um, and then I had my own doubts about what I was doing. And I don't want to paint such a bleak picture because there was some great times too. And there yeah. was wonderful times and, you know, times where I felt really confident about what I was doing personally. And then, and I love the team and the, the, the crew were just, you know, phenomenal. And all that stuff was also happening. But, you know, when I look back at Mulan, it was the biggest roller coaster experience of my life. Just high highs and low lows. And it was yeah. just one day after another until it was finished. When, when it is finished. No, let's, let's, take a, let's take a step back for just a second. I want to go to just to finishing it. Um, but during this process, what are you most proud of from Mulan? And then it's a two-parter. And what are you most proud of through your entire animation career? On Mulan, I'm not proud of, I would always point to, I was the most proud of what I saw around me by the crew, the Mm -hmm. things that the, you know, the hard work, the long hours, but on top of it, those moments of inspiration of like, I remember seeing one of the first Sean Yu scenes by Prez Romanillos and was like, oh my gosh, that's going to be in this movie. That's awesome. Yeah. And or Tom um, working really hard and that very first scene that he animated that because it was a time when we thought Tom was going to make it and I had to have some real frank conversations with my brother, you know, and there was I got a lot of heat and pressure from executives like maybe Tom's not the right guy I mean, we might have to make a change and, you know, Tony, you need to be really thinking about that. Um, so uh, but then when he did this the scene where um mushu rises you know yeah. kind of rises from the i live, I live. Tell yeah. Me what, yeah uh you know <laughs> that whole scene that was one of his first not his first one but it was pretty early on and if it wasn't for that scene uh and and i was so proud of what he did with that he really put a lot into it and made it different from chris sanders had done the boards and they were just genius mm-hmm. So there was already a lot going for that scene and the, the recording that you know Eddie did was great. So Tom had to really step up and kind of meet all that. Um, and he, he just succeeded it. It was just a home run. And then the effects animation of all the smoke is just brilliant. Um, and uh, by Troy uh, Gustafson, Gustafson, uh, I'm getting his name wrong. But um, so it was those kind of moments that, that not only spurred me on, but also really excited me. Uh, and it also made, you know, the animator inside of me that was used to being in the trenches, I got jealous sometimes of like, gosh, I wish I could have done that scene or, oh man, you know, I, I, I want to just dig in there and make part of the film. Because as the director, you don't really feel like, it's a weird feeling. You don't really feel like you're making the film because you're not really, you're just kind of telling people how to make the film or telling or judging people's quality of how they're making the film. And you know, um, so I'm just giving advice and, and direction and things like that, but I never feel like I'm actually making the film because they're all doing that, you know? Um, so it was a real surreal thing. And, and the amateur part of me, I just, 
wish that I could be in my office animating mm -hmm. most days. Um, and I did do four scenes. I animated four scenes because I just was like, I gotta, I gotta feel like I'm being more productive. You know, I want to, I want to contribute in a, in a deeper way. Let me actually animate a couple shots, you know? And, um, so I did in the evenings and weekends, I animated four scenes in the movie. I know you brought it up on your podcast, uh, before, but what four scenes, cause I, my mind is drawing a blank right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I stole a, a Mushu scene from Tom and it was when, uh, Mushu gets thrown out of the ancestors uh, 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 place and, and he goes, scrape, scrape, scrape. And then he pops back <laughs> in, he says, so you get back to me on the job thing. And then his gong gets thrown in his face. Um, that was a fun, you know, physical comedy thing that I really loved. Uh, I did a Cricky scene towards the end of, when uh, Cricky is looking up at Mulan when she's like, and she's at the campfire and Moosh is, uh, you know, barbecuing it or um, doing a dumpling on, over the fire. And, and Cricky is just looks up at Mulan. It was just a simple pantomime scene and he's all sad for her. Um, I did a matchmaker scene in the beginning of the movie when the, um, when Cricky goes down her top, that's the scene I animated of the matchmaker. And she starts whoo, 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 and starts freaking out and her, her butt's on fire and the whole thing. Um, just one scene. And then um, actually Aaron Blaze did the one right after it where she's, her butt goes on fire. Um, and then, oh, I did a Chifu scene. So yeah. uh, towards the end of the movie, Chifu, uh, oh, uh, the emperor bows to Mulan and he's like, what, what, oh. And then he quickly bows, uh, throws himself down, you know, following suit. That, and that's the, so a lot of pantomime, physical comedy stuff that I picked up. And yeah, that's really cool, man. And that, that scene with the matchmaker that um, I, I talked about it with, oh, shit, man, all these interviews are starting. I'm pretty sure you have it too. They just kind of start to blend in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're trying to pick, but I, I I'm, it might have been John or it might have been Chris or it might have been Aaron. I can't remember. But uh, no, it was with Tom Cito, excuse me, because uh, Robin Williams came up because we were doing Genie Talk. Mm. And uh, Robin Williams is my favorite actor of all time. And there's sure. no, but, and for me, there's nobody close. There's nobody better. It just, he is the pinnacle, right? He's the bar and everybody else is trying to reach it. Mm. And when I, I remember watching that as a kid, that scene of the opening for Mulan. And I remember I was like, is that, is that Mrs. Doubtfire? Is this, was this a nod to, to Mrs. Doubtfire? Cause it had that, it had that vibe to it, you know, when she lights herself on fire. Yeah. She takes the, she takes the pot holder. She's like, Oh, and then, you know, so it was just like that, that scene alone, I don't know what it was, but it was just like, I, I love that scene because it made me think so fondly of Robin as Mrs. Doubtfire. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, like I said, flash forward and we got to well, ask a couple more questions and we'll rotate the fans questions. We'll do a wrap up. Okay. Um, but uh, what were some of your favorite scenes from this movie? Mm. I mean, hands down. Now I, I had a, a daughter that was born on Lion King. So I already had a young girl daughter. What am I saying? Yes, I had a young daughter at the <laughs> time. And then I had another daughter that was born midway through Mulan. So by that point, I had, you know, two daughters. And then I ultimately had a third daughter that came during Emperor's New Groove. Um, so, um, but being the father of daughters, you know, the, the most emotional uh, scene for me, the most impactful one is well there's two in the beginning of the film we call it the blossom moment when when he's comparing they're sitting together uh, Mulan and Fazu on the bench and they're looking up at those and he's trying to you know in a Chinese parable kind of way he's comparing this blossom but look you know something's uh, uh, you know this one hasn't blossomed yet and um, and it's a poignant moment that says something shows that he has wisdom and understanding of where she's at um but without actually talking about her so in a very chinese way he's he's connecting with her and telling her it's okay mm -hmm. i know who you are and i know you haven't blossomed yet you still have a lot to to go and you're gonna make it you know that kind of thing and it, in that moment it's reassuring for her um even though they're not quite connecting right yet right yet and then fast forward to the end of the movie after she's, you know, uh, you know, killed Shan Yu and, and saved China and, and the emperor's bowed to her and given her, given her the sword of Shan Yu and this pendant and all this. She comes back home and same bench. He's sitting there under the blossom tree and she comes to try and say, 
I, you know, I did this all for you. I didn't know what it was all about when I did it, but I did this for you and I, I hope you're okay with me. And I hope, you know, I hope I've proven myself to you and, and these honors are for you. Um, and he pushes them away and says, the greatest gift and honor is having you as my daughter. And there's something yeah, about the nice. resonance, the, uh, just the emotional quality in a very serious Chinese way that our actor that does Bazu hit that line that to this day, I get choked up when I hear it. You know, his reading is just so resonant, so deep, and yet so staunch and serious in a way too, but uh, so impactful. And he just, oh my gosh. I remember hearing it in the booth when he recorded it, thinking it was great. And it wasn't until we cut it together with picture and then with the storyboards, and then ultimately when it's animated, it went to color and every step, it got better and better. And um, you know, it just became my favorite moment of the film. Yeah, it's a really pretty moment, man. You're going to get me all choked up here. Um, oh, you're going to feel it when you have that baby. <laughs> dude, I can't wait. Get that baby daughter, and then you guys sit down and watch the movie together. Dude, that's what we've been doing, like, ever since. Uh, so what, he was born, my, my youngest one, as of right now. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to have another baby. Um, hey, we've, congratulations. We've, thanks. We've, we, I think we've talked about it a couple of times on the podcast. I just don't think those ones are released just yet. Um, but, uh, what we've been doing ever since he was born, uh, was well, you've had small kids, small girl children, right? I think yeah. is what you said, how, how girl, you broke female them children, yeah. girl, female children. Yeah. Uh, so whenever you have something small, you got to kind of divide your time between mom and dad. So mom would jump in the shower. Dad's got the baby. Dad would jump in the shower. Mom's got the baby. So for the first couple months, I was watching an episode of Samurai Jack the entire night. Right. And then when he started to be able to like sit up a little bit more and hold his head and all this other stuff. Yeah. I started looking at the screen. I was like, man, I don't think I should be watching Samurai Jack because it was the fifth and final season for Adult Swim. I'm like, this one got a little darker. So I was like, I can't do this one just yet. So we had Disney Plus. So we're always putting on Disney Plus. And this my, my favorite Disney movie of all time has always been The Jungle Book. There's something so wow. special about that movie. Um, great it, it, it's Baloo. Baloo is like my favorite hero through the entire disney universe i mean it's just there's something about that character that is so fun and then you got king louis i actually named my first dog after king louis i named him louis <laughs> uh, you know so it was just there's something fun about that one but what i've gotten to experience by having another kid and re-watching these because my 13 year old he'll he'll sit down and watch them he's more he loves the music so whenever we're eating dinner we usually have uh, we'll have alexa play uh disney soundtracks or disney favorites or something like that so it's just going through all of the great disney songs um and then what we've been doing like i said is we're re-watching everything we started with uh, snow white so we just went through the entire catalog and we're kind of doing it again wow because cooper the youngest he's starting to become a little <laughs> and uh I got a real affinity for 101 Dalmatians. Now I, I didn't appreciate this movie as I do now, but just looking at it, knowing and hearing what I've heard when I've talked to Floyd Norman and, and hearing the stuff that he said about it, and what Walt was saying about it, Ken Henderson having a heart attack over the movie, you know, wow. it's just, there is something beautiful about that movie from start to finish as well. Um, you know, so it, it is fun getting to go back and revisit these and see these with little kids because you're looking at them to see like, man, is that what I look like when I watch this for the first time? Did I have that same interaction or did I have that same reaction? Right. You yeah, know, so yeah. it's really, really fun. And one thing I love asking, you know, you guys and gals that I have on when you've directed a movie, what was it like seeing Mulan out in the wild with a completely just a whole civilian crowd? They had no animators in there. <clears throat> what was that like? What was that feeling? That like? was... Um nerve-wracking i would say it's probably the first thing i would think of because we're, one of our very first screenings was uh you know after the movie comes out you do what's called a press junket and you take the movie around and you let press see it from different territories so we had a um one of our first press tours was um yeah in the united states we did one but we took it to china and our most nervous screening was in hong kong because this was the first time that a true Chinese audience was going to be seeing what we, these Westerners, these white guys made out of this Chinese girl's tale, which is beloved. You know, the story of Mulan is a beloved tale um, in China. And it's, that's really her, you know, China's daughter really yeah. in a lot of ways. So they really, it's, it's valuable to them. It's impactful for them. They hand it down as a, a, a kind of a moral lesson to kids in school. They, they've done songs about Mulan I mean, you name it. Um, we saw statues to Mulan in China. 
So to play it for them, we just thought, oh my gosh, they're going to, what if they stone us? You know, what if, what, what if they send us to jail or they don't let us leave the country without torturing us first? I don't know. I mean, we were just like, you know, this could really go poorly. You know, we have no idea at that point what people are going to think from China. Yeah. Um, thankfully, it, it ended well. The, the, the lights came up and there was a huge response after the movie was over. But during the movie, we were like, uh, oh, here comes a funny part. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't respond because they were, they're not really too vocal in China at the time anyway, when they would see funny parts in movies, they wouldn't respond very much, you know. Um, they weren't, it wasn't, it just wasn't like a US audience where we we're more vocal about things and stuff. Um, so we didn't know how it was going to go until the lights came up and then there was big applause, you know, and yeah. we could tell that they really liked it. And, um, and since then, that's been the best, really kind of most gratifying um, audience and people that have said that they've liked the movie has been Chinese. I have a, a pastor at my church uh, who is uh, 100% Chinese. Um, and he told me once, uh, uh, kind of took me aside and said, I, I have to tell you that Mulan was hugely impactful for me in my relationship with my father. Um, and that meant a lot to me. But I've also, I remember at an early screening, a father of a daughter came up to me and he says, I didn't think I would ever have, um, because of Chinese culture and that kind of feeling of you can't really hug your kids or show a lot of affection, he says, I didn't know that I'd be able to ever enjoy, you know, um, <clears throat> a very emotional connection with my daughter until I took her to go see Mulan. And after that, I felt a freedom to, to hug my daughter. And he says, wow. we've been hugging, uh, you know, our, the rest of our lives. And, and I said, he said, I, I have a different relationship, a better relationship with my daughter because of Mulan. So thank you. And he was crying. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so things like that are like, whoa, you just don't know. You just don't know when you're making these films how they're going to impact anyone, let alone the world or have a cultural impact. It's just, to this day, it's very surreal. I got to tell you, Justin, it's very surreal. That's a beautiful moment, man. I, I mean, I get it. I can only imagine, like I've heard so many stories about people, uh, voice actors, especially, you know, um, Cheryl Chase, she was the voice of Angelica Pickles from Rugrats. Oh, yeah. And some of her story, Rob Paulson had some of the same stories too, where they would talk to kids that were in the cancer wards. Mm. They're, they're, they're make a wish. And I'm going to say this without trying to cry, man, because it, it, it broke me down when Cheryl did it. And the same thing with Rob, you know, but getting to talk to these kids and all they wanted to do was just talk to their favorite character, or sing their favorite character's favorite song, you know, getting to see something like a movie, a TV show, a, a book, a comic book, um, you know, food, Ratatouille, man, that, that scene with Ego where he drops, I've said it so many times where he drops that fork after Remy. Uh, like I said, I cook for a living. I've, I've wanted to be a chef since I was 12 years old. So that That's movie awesome. is very special as well. Yeah. Um, Brad Bird, amazing, genius, 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 genius. Um, I have him on the show. Oh man, one day. I hope so. Because the Iron Giant, hands down, favorite animated movie of all time. There's yeah. like I said, that's the bar, that's the pinnacle. That's what everybody's trying to reach. Man, that is a perfect movie for start to finish. Mulan's yeah. fantastic too. I'm not trying to throw you under the bus no, here. No, but <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to reach that pinnacle of Iron Giant. Yeah, it, it's it's such a beautiful movie. But but getting to hear the stories like that, like that man that addressed you, he's he said he gets to hug. He didn't know there's something it's it's so foreign because I didn't grow up with a dad, right? You said you came from yeah. a single, single mother. So I did yeah. the same thing. Mine went, yeah. Mine went to prison real young. Right. So he mm. didn't, he didn't want kids. Uh, you know, he's kind of going through it now. He's, he's got terminal cancer. So, you know, mm. we've tried to reconnect, but it's just, it's one of those things that it's where, I don't know, man, it's like 25 years. You didn't want to be around me. Now it's at the end of your, at the end of your life. It sounds a lot colder than I mean it because I still talk to him. You know, I, I never shut that door on somebody. It's just, it's a different relationship. It's like an acquaintance relationship more than anything. Exactly. Yeah. You know, exactly. but it, it's just like getting to see or hear these type of stories and go, fuck, man, there's so, there's something so powerful about a movie. There's something so powerful about a plate of spaghetti that you share with your family or, you know, a bowl of mm -hmm. lasagna, whatever it is. It's just, it's something cool that it brings everybody together and getting to hear those type of stories, man, it really warms my heart. Um, last question before we rotate the fans questions. 
Okay. You brought up Eddie Murphy, right? Mushu himself, man. What was your favorite story from your recording sessions? Do you have one or do you have a funny moment? Yeah, I mean, it was probably, <laughs> we didn't know what to expect. Well, I'll back up a little bit and just say that when um, that, that casting came out of the blue for us, we were looking at all kinds of different casting. Um, and at the time, Lion King came out. So we were, we were really thinking at first, like maybe he's this New Yorkish kind of Nathan Lane kind of yeah. wise guy, New Yorker kind of thing. So um, um, we were looking at, you know, characters and actors that were similar to that. Um, oh, gosh, I can't remember some of the early names that we had. Um, but uh, it was Michael Eisner, actually, who was then the, you know, the head of Disney, CEO of Disney and president that... Um, he had when he was at Paramount, he had fostered a relationship with Eddie Murphy because he he cast him or put him in in the big role that defined his career, which was um, Beverly Hills Cop. Yes. And so he, he and and he felt like Eddie kind of you know uh, uh, owed him one because he <laughs> put him in that role or or got him in that role as the the main yeah. executive kind of greenlit the film. And so um, he was the one that recommended him. Said you know you should get Eddie Murphy to do this. And we we're like. He was so, he was in a, at the time he was in a different atmosphere of like the stratosphere, and so we we're like, oh man, do you think we can get him? And but we had never gone there like going. Uh, but then the more we thought about, it, we thought, wow, I mean that's a better contrast actually towards Mulan. You know, you know you got this ancient Chinese culture, they're very serious and stuff, and then throw this kind of like urban street smart, you know, uh, black guy, funny guy that could be really. So we really started warming to that idea. And um, once we got him, and it was all because of Michael Eisner pushing those buttons, but Eddie was not really into the idea. It was really just, okay, I'll do this cartoon thing as a favor. And, uh, you know, he didn't really, uh, and I don't even know if he had like small kids at the time. So, because that's usually a reason that a lot of big stars do this, right? For their, for their kids, doing it for the yeah. kids. Um, and so he was still trying to really make it as a movie star. Um, and, and even at the time, a pop star, he had a song that was out, uh, My Girl Wants to Party All the Time. I don't know if you remember that one. <laughs> one hit wonder. Oh, it wasn't um, good. <laughs> yeah, it was not good. Uh, but it was popular for a little while. Um, so when, when we, we had a heck of a time getting him to uh, commit to a schedule and get in there, we were coming up some really uh, uh, important dates for us because animation was starting. My brother was in charge of Mushu at that time and we didn't have enough work for him to work on because we only had scratch dialogue in the reels and we hadn't recorded any. And so uh, Michael Eisner had to say, he got on a call with Eddie because you know it was like six months in and we still don't have any recording done with him. And he was, he kept putting us off, putting us off. And we would get caught between his entourage of, you know, like, you know, we couldn't even talk to Eddie because he was so surrounded by family and, and representation. Um, so finally, uh, Eisner got on with him and said, Eddie, you got to do this. Just do it. You know, give him some time. Just give him a couple days or something like that. They got to get through this. So you got to do this. And sure enough, like in a week, we were in with Eddie and we went to his house in New Jersey that was his mandate was like, okay, if they want to do this, they got to do it, you know, in my basement recording studio. And because he was like this, wanted to be this pop star, he had this whole professional recording studio in his basement in New Jersey. And so we, you know, we, we get there early, we set up all of our, we had to bring in special microphones and stuff that it was a little bit better quality for voiceover. And, um, you know, it's been a, an hour or something, you know, getting it all set. And then the first impression I had, which is, I think is the best that I had of Eddie was he came down in his bathrobe, you know, he was, up there. <laughs> he was swimming in his pool. So he came in his bathrobe. He rodney and, dangerous. Uh, came right and said, Hey man, I'm sorry. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd shake your hands, but I just had a blimpy. I just had a blimpy upstairs and I got blimpy all over my fingers. I don't want to touch you guys right now because of the blimpy on my fingers. That's disgusting. I know it's disgusting. I'm sorry. And, um, and then he just got in front of the microphone and we were worried, like, has he even seen the script? We didn't know if his people got him the script, but he just nailed it. And um, we, we've decided that, yeah, he must have seen it. He must have studied it, made little, I think he had notes in the margin of it too, his own little notes and um, just a professional, you know, right when he hit, it was like, he didn't, he didn't know who we were. We, we could have been the plumbers coming to fix his plumbing. I think that's kind of how he treated us. It was just like, we were not special to him. 
you know, and he was doing this favor. And yet it was still like, he just knocked it out of the park. He was so professional and good. He got it. You know, we really wrote, you know, a lot of people ask like, oh, well, obviously he did a lot of improv, right? You, you must have let him do a lot of improv. He did not do a lot of improv. So even, even like uh, when Mushu's, you know, um, you know, uh, dishonor on you, dishonor on your cow, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It sounds very improv but that was, all those lines were written. And uh, wow. we just wrote for Eddie Murphy because we, once we knew that we had him, our writers were good and they knew how to write for him. That's awesome, man. Uh, Rodney Dangerfield, you man, he came down in his bathroom. That's yes, that's 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 the type of t- type of uh, movie star I, I like to hear about. Just ah, oh, comfortable in his own skin, man. <laughs> down in my bathrobe, man. Well, like I said, Tony, this has been a uh, real fun. We'll rotate in the fans' questions before we let the fans have you, man. There's always a couple that we like to ask before, even though we've asked a bunch the last hour. But uh, <laughs> you get to your Mount Rushmore, man. So you have four people plus one. Who's on your Mount? Who's on Tony's Mount Rushmore? Oh man, um, I mean Charles Schultz, hands down, wasn't one of my biggest um, role models when I was young. I think I told you. I- Oh yeah, yes. You got a little Snoopy tattoo that you're showing me, and yeah, oh, Charlie, Charlie Brown. Yeah, huge Charles awesome. Schultz fan. Oh, yeah. if I was gonna, I told my wife, if I was gonna get a tattoo, it would be of Snoopy, um, hands down. Um, I've always, always looked up to Charles Schultz and those characters as being perfect, you know. And they were a big part of my childhood. It was the reason I started drawing um, Charles Schultz for sure. Um, Chuck Jones, uh, I would say, is definitely there, too. I was highly impacted once I started getting more and more into animation by his work on Bugs Bunny and huge fan of uh, uh, The Grinch That Sold Christmas and some of the other stuff that Chuck has done. Um, Boy, um, Bill Watterson, again, another comic strip guy, was a huge impact on me for what he did in comics and just his great drawing and the appeal that he added to everything. Um, and then a fourth one, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to embarrass my brother and say, Tom, you yeah. know, yeah, hopefully he never hears this, but um, <laughs> <laughs> Tom, uh, Tom was a big influence on me and I can't ignore that, you know, as competitive as we were, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for Tom and uh, the artistry, the inspiration, you know, the, you know, give me a hard time when I needed it, a kick in the butt, all that. Um, yeah, I have to say him. And who was your honorable mention? Honorable mention. Uh, there's so many. Oh, gosh. Um, I'm going to say Freddie Moore, a classic Disney animator. He created the, the uh, I love Mickey Mouse, uh, probably second to Snoopy uh, and Charlie Brown. Uh, Mickey Mouse was always highly influential. And, and Freddie Moore really made the defining Mickey Mouse that we know and love today in 1932. That's the model sheet that Disney uses as like, you know, the first one with pupils and stuff like that. So, um, or whites of the eyes, you know, that was the one that he made and I loved his work. Uh, he was phenomenal. Beautiful. Um, and you brought up the Grinch, man. Have you ever had Phil Roman on your podcast? No, no. Do you know Phil Roman? I mean, I know of him, but I've never met him. Oh man, I would love to make the connection for you. Uh, I'll, you I'll see. What, yeah, that would be a dream come true. Yeah, I, I, I had him come on, and he's—I uh, think he's one of the last animators that are actually animated on the How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And his Chuck Jones stories—he was—he's—he's he's 94 years old. All there, man. It was him, and I've had him, and I've had Bob Singer. Bob Singer is an old school Hanna Barbera um, uh, animator, uh, animated on the original Scooby Doo. They're some of I. It's gonna sound bad. But when you get to that age, you, you start to see, you know, faculty starting to leave, but the yeah. stories, everything was there. It was just hearing, hearing him, like he was talking, Chuck Jones was his hero. He was nothing but super gratif- gratif- gratified, 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 can't think of the word, but <laughs> grateful. That's the word. Uh, so, you know, Chuck's looking through, looking through his scenes and he was like, who did this? And then Phil's back. He's like, uh, I, I did. I did. He's like, you're an animator. He was like, that validated my entire life, my entire career. He was like, I was, I think he was in his twenties at that point. He was like, my hero told me I'm an animator. And he was like, right. I don't need anything else. And he was yeah. just so, such a cool dude, but I'd like to make that connection with you. Yeah, um, so I'll you. send him, I'll send him your email as soon as we're That'd off. Be awesome. Um, yeah. So the second one is uh, 
two books that any fan of animation or anybody in animation should have on their shelves? What two books would you recommend? Well, absolutely. They call it the Animation Bible, The Illusion of Life by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson. I think, you know, that came out when I was in CalArts or, or soon before, right before I came, went to CalArts. And we all had it on our desks. I still think it's a really valuable tool, even though it has a lot of history in it and kind of behind the scenes stories, which are fun uh, of Walt. And, and But it also like gives you a really, I mean, it's where the 12 principles of animation come from. I teach those 12 principles at school right now at the university that I work at. And we, we would be no, nowhere, uh, nowhere in animation if it wasn't for that tome. I feel like it's a real valuable, valuable tool that everybody should have. The other one is um, one from my childhood that before I even discovered the illusion of life was really impactful for me because it's really basic, really simply written and has beautiful illustrations, but it's Preston Blair's, Preston Blair's animation uh, or cartoon animation. Mm -hmm. And I, when I was a kid, well, I still have the copy that we got when we were probably, Tom and I were probably like, I don't know, I want to say like eight or 10. And when it, and we got this early copy and it was really big and stuff. And it was uh, Walter Fawcett put out these art books and, and that was one in a series by Preston Blair. Um, and so that was one of the first ones where I really figured out what animation was and kind of drew more like an animator with really rhythmic drawing and stuff. Um, so that was hugely, and I, I like how simply uh, Preston Blair talks about character design and, and movement and animation and drawing and stuff, some of the early principles. Um, so yeah, on a high end, The Illusion of Life uh, is definitely like, you know, if you want to be a pro in animation, you got to have that. But if you're just beginning and you want to learn like, do I even like animation or cartooning? Preston Blair's book, uh, Cartoon Animation is the one to get. It's, it's in reprints, so you can find it. Beautiful. Um, and this one's this one's always fun. This is the animation recommendation. Nick Ranieri actually dropped your name. So the animation recommendation is folks that we should reach out to. We had to get him on the show. And Nick Ranieri dropped your name, man. So who would be your animation recommendation? Who should we reach out to? I mean, you know, my buddy, Mike Surrey, who was my best friend at Disney, we worked together on a lot of films. He did Cogsworth, uh, or sorry, I did Cogsworth to his Lumiere, mm -hmm. even though Nick was actually his boss, uh, at, as you know, as the supervising animator of Lumiere. We were like junior animators together and then kind of rose through the ranks together. And on Lion King, <clears throat> he did Timon and I did Pumbaa. And so um, he's got a lot of great stories. So I definitely uh, want to throw out uh, Mike's story to you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then... Uh, uh, I would say somebody that doesn't get a lot of rec recognition, uh, but is a great 2D animator um, and really influential is Randy Haycock. If you haven't talked to Randy Haycock, yeah. he was an old school Disney animator from my generation. And uh, yeah, he still works for the Disney studios. He's still in feature animation. He's been there for like 30 years. Beautiful. We'll reach out to them, man. Uh, thank you for the animation recommendations. That's always fun because it, it leads me just like your book recommendations that you guys give, it leads me to learning as much as I can. I mean, it all started with this book right here of Mice mm. of Magic by Leonard Malton. Um, and that one was a recommendation by Fred Seibert, Hanna-Barbera's last president. And, uh, you know, whenever I can get a new book, uh, have you read the Disney Revolt yet? No, I haven't. I'm, I'm eager to, though. Uh, I just had Jake, the, uh, the, the author for that one. That one is phenomenal. Like, you read a book or you see something I'm like this should be a movie mafia is involved in walt disney walt disney almost got blown up by a bomb like how the hell did all this stuff happen and nobody yeah i don't even know those stories i would love to yeah i gotta read that uh, so it, 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 and it's about the strike right the 1940 yeah. something strike yeah, yeah it was right before uh september not september 11th man uh that was horrible this uh Pearl Harbor. I don't know Pearl why. Harbor. I'm a Navy yeah. guy. I should be able to recall Pearl Harbor like that. <laughs> yeah, that's a they, pivotal they, moment. Well, that and they beat the hell out of us when we were in when we were in boot camp. They beat the crap out of they. You had to know certain dates. You had to know certain people. You had to know certain things. And Pearl Harbor was the one that tripped up almost everybody. And I've always been a huge. You're not supposed to be a huge fan of war, but World War II has always been my favorite war to learn about and you know study yeah. about. You know, so I had a bunch of those dates. You know, drilled in there, even though I had that that uh freudian slip there i suppose um but uh yeah that one that one's really really special that book's really really good but anyways we got some questions here yeah. uh, from the fans they wanted to pick your brain 
Uh, some of these are are funny, uh, and then some of these are pretty serious. And this one was by far one of my favorite ones. Uh, this is uh, submitted by a guy named Cameron. He's always writing, and he's got some very insightful questions, but he has some really good funny ones today, too. Uh, he wanted to know, have you ever been in a fist fight? If so, can you recall what caused it and who won the fight? If not, <laughs> can you recall witnessing a brawl as a bystander? So let's take Tom out of the equation because I've got a younger brother too. Yeah, I've got brothers and sisters. Oh yeah, I was going to say Tom for sure. <laughs> fights. Um, well, since we're talking about Tom, who 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 would get the who would get the better of them? You guys are both pretty. Oh, <laughs> I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I, I feel like we need to settle that. So I think <laughs> I think we should schedule that actually and put that on the club <laughs> sometime this year. You know, we're not too old, I think, to fight each other. Put it on the uh, Patreon channel. A, you know, a little street brawl. Um, I don't know. I mean, I can't even remember the last time we fought, but but he was probably the last person I got into a fist fight with. It was probably my brother. I do remember there was some bully at school that probably, you know, an older, older, uh, older kid, a couple of years older that that kicked my butt. <clears throat> um yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a lot of uh, violent memories, I must say. That's a good thing, man. Uh, do you, st- he had one more. He said, uh, do you still enjoy and love what you do the same way you did back in the day? If yeah. so, how much has your perspective changed over the years? You know, I've gotten more of an appreciation, I guess. I, I think when I first started, I, I've always loved animation. I've always loved cartooning. I've always loved art. I'm still on fire for all those things. It's really what fuels both Tom and I for the podcast, I think is just a, just a, a geeky fanboy feeling that we still have for animation and and i think that's that love hopefully comes through in the podcast i mean just like you julian i mean your knowledge and appreciation for the art form and stuff i can you know you feel it you know and and that's what the audience really connects with so whether or not they know all that you know um it makes them interested right so um yeah for me i still have that love i still have that passion sitting down at the at, at a at a table at my art desk whatever and just drawing is probably the happiest place i could find you know it's the happiest place in my world um i love it and it's better than directing or accolades or awards or anything like that N- nothing makes me dry or the money even nothing makes me want to do what i do except for the love of sitting down to draw just making a funny drawing there's nothing better yeah, that's something special to hold on to, too. Um, this one's fun. Uh, Donovan Marcus wants to know, what is your favorite childhood memory? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of my earliest ones is um, I, I went into the hospital, and I, again, I was separated from Tom, and that was hard. It was kind of scary because it was, it was just me. I had an issue with my mouth, and they were going to do some surgery on a tooth that had turned improperly as it was growing in. And I was very young. Um, and because I was going to be in a hospital overnight, my mom brought to me a stuffed animal and a little mouse character, a little mouse stuffed animal. And I called him Mousy, very original. Um, <laughs> and that mouse uh, meant so much to me. I, not only did it get me through the night being alone at the hospital, but then onward, you know, that was my plush toy. That was my, my friend. Yeah. And so when it wasn't Tom, it was Mousy, And I had such an affinity for mice that I think that's what really attracts me to. I, I love drawing Mickey Mouse. I loved, I, I created a series called Lenny and Sid that was about a rabbit and a mouse. I, to this day, I, my go-to thing to sketch is usually mice of some kind, you know, and I make them warriors or something like that. I like to, you know, fantasy, uh, fantasy up the, the mouse realm a little bit. But um, yeah, I just have an affinity for mice and I think it goes back to Mousy. Do you still have Mousy? I do. Oh, I that's do. so cool, man. Uh, He's yeah, in the box right now because I just moved out here to Tennessee. So I got to find him again, but I know I have him somewhere. That's cool, man. And uh, did you ever read? Do you ever read to your, did you ever read to your kids when they were small? Yes. I love to read my kids. I do voices, the whole thing. It's fun. my my uh, my oldest one because I would try to do voices and stuff. 
uh, and he would he would look at me. He's like, you just you're you're not good. I was still in the military. He's like, you're not you're not good at this voice. Just read it, read it, read it regularly. <laughs> they cut you down, and they don't mean yeah. to because they're just honest. They're straight to the point. You know, there's they're happy, they're sad. There's no in between. There's no gray with kids. Yeah. Um, you know, he was like, did you just drink, you read it normal tonight, man? I just I want to go to bed. <laughs> I don't want to do this. <laughs> so, and then my my youngest Cooper, uh, for he ha- he has we haven't done it lately, but for eight straight months where the wild things are i read that every single night at least twice and it oh got to the point where i would just look over at my wife and i'm i'm reading it and i'm just flipping the pages i don't have to i've got it memorized <laughs> all up you here it yeah it's such a beautiful book man i, I really enjoy that one yeah um, <clears throat> yeah so uh here we go ha this sounds so cool. I really enjoyed Mulan and the character from the Emperor's New Groove. I would ask, do you have a favorite scene or moment from the Emperor's New Groove? And that's oh, by Emperor's New Groove. Yeah, Tynisho Lewis. If I pronounce your name, I apologize. I mean, I did the whole sequence of the first time that the Kronk's devil and angel, his conscience oh, shows up on his shoulder. I did all those scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I hogged it, you know, I was like the supervised animator. So I had some control over the casting of the, of all the, the, the shots between myself and the unit. And I like, I held on to those yeah. and there was a good eight or 10 scenes in that sequence. And it was hard because, you know, as the, as the production goes on, you get a lot of pressure of like, okay, we got to get through these. We're going to get through these. And, you know, there's so much more that you have on your desk and I am like, give, I'll give up the other stuff, but let me hold on to this section so um, for me, that was probably the best. And then the other one, which I, there's some regrets I have about this scene because the dialogue is so great. It's one of the most memorable lines of Kronk. And that's, oh, the poison, the poison for Cusco. <laughs> the poison chose especially to kill Cusco. Cusco's poison. That poison? You know, and um, that one, I got it fairly early on. I wasn't really... I didn't really feel like I was drawing Kronk as, as good as I wanted to be because it was early on, you know, and as an animator, you actually get better and better the more you do. And so it's not, they say, you know, the, the, the funny joke is that, you know, by the time you finish your last scene, you're ready to actually start the film, but you know, you're, you're done now and you kind of got to put it all away. So um, yeah, because that was early on, I feel like there's so much more I wanted to do with that scene um and also just i look at the drawings and i'm a little embarrassed by it i gotta tell you man uh i i i was trying to stay away from emperor's new group as much as possible because i'm hoping to have you on down the road when you know you're settled in and we can talk maybe sometime next year uh yeah because emperor's new groove it does not get it's it's a cult classic for sure but yeah. knowing what I know now from the Sweatbox documentary, hearing everything, listening to Nick talk the stories, Sandro talk about it as well. Sandro's mm. another guy that I've had on here. He's just, that, and his oh, wow. enthusiasm for this is so infectious. It's so great. It was so fun just talking to Sandro. He always makes me smile. Um, but talking Emperor's New Groove, that movie is amazing. I just quoted the when you brought up the devil and the angel on Kronk's shoulder. We were literally doing it at work today. We were talking about actually getting into – uh, fights <clears throat> from our former employees where both of us used to work at the same restaurant and how they treated us during COVID. They got rid of us and it was just a real nasty way. It was a real, oh, real bad, real bad way on how they got rid of us. Yeah. Um, but I was like, man, I, I really wanted to put the hands on that guy. Right. And then I had that little, I had that little devil. And he's like, I didn't have the angel that Kronk had. I had two red guys. He's like, do it. I had, I had dark Kermit on there. He's like, do it, just do it. And I was like, nah, <laughs> do it. Yeah, do it. <laughs> so, but yeah, man, that that movie is so special. Like, it gets quoted in my house. I use No Touchy at least once or twice a week, man. It's just <laughs> that movie. That movie is so great, and there's it's so fun. Um, yeah, yeah, the lines and the voice readings, and just I don't know. Yeah, there is a magic about that. It's become so meme worthy and uh, taken over the internet in so many different ways. I mean, it's that's really what has given it such life. I think. Is, yeah the internet and all the memes that are out there i mean i use in the bring it on gif with cusco going down the river getting ready to go yeah, over the water. Yeah. at least once a week i'm using that in the in the text thread with my friends man but like i said tony <laughs> this has been a real blast and we've talked about your podcast a few times but where can they go to find your amazing you and tom's amazing podcast man i love I it kind of wherever you get your podcast but certainly it's on itunes spotify um you know all the big podcast places um, you can find it, but if you do check it out, we always ask people to, you know, send us a review. We'd love to yes. see what you think of it. 
Um, on iTunes, that's the best way to do it is on iTunes is just post a review. Um, and people have been so generous over the years, uh, but it really inspires us to keep going, just hearing from the audience. So the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast, it's on iTunes and Spotify. And if you could tell them one episode that you know that would get hooked on, what would be that episode you think you guys had the most fun doing? Oh, gosh. You know, recently we did one because now I'm in Nashville and um, I think Tom and I have a better chemistry when we're in the room together because often most of the interviews we've done, we haven't been. It's all been on Zoom. Um, and so we did one uh, about Miyazaki, actually. Yes. Who I'm a big fan of Hayao Miyazaki, a kind of a tribute episode to him. And it came out like two weeks ago. Um, I really think people would like that one um, because of our banter, probably. Uh, that one, and then um, we're huge Glenn Keane fans, uh, who's like the Disney rock star of all time. And we had him on a couple times, but the, the last time we had him on, he talked about his faith. He talked about um, uh, uh, just being a Christian in the animation industry and, and, and just kind of got real deep, you know? And uh, I really recommend that one too, if, uh, because a lot of people are, uh, it's Glenn kind of showing a different side of himself. Um, and yeah, he's a powerhouse animator and all this kind of stuff too, but you know, he gets real personal in it, which was cool. Yeah, it was really pretty. I think that was one where he talked uh, very briefly about the shoes with Kobe, um, which was, yeah. yeah, it was, that one was, I'm a huge NBA Pure fan. basketball. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a really tough, that was actually the last time me and my oldest son went and seen a magic game was the day Kobe Bryant died. Uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, the magic were playing the Los Angeles Clippers that day. Um, and. It, it, I got goosebumps now just thinking about it. But I mean, my son and I all dressed in gold. I will never wear another purse. This is my favorite hat of all time. No yeah. other, no other NBA team will adorn this head, this body. No, it just, it doesn't work like that. But that day <laughs> we all wore gold and purple. Uh, I changed the lights out. My, my lights outside were golden because they flipped between colors and stuff. So they were golden purple. Wow. I think for like two months after him and Gigi and everybody that lost their life in that tragic day uh, passed, but it was, yeah. It was the one of the most surreal moments I'd ever seen. And, and I was in Pearl Harbor when I was in the Navy. I got to go across where those ships and those people were down at the bottom, rendering honors and salutes. That at, at that point in time, that was one of the most surreal experiences. But going to a basketball game where everybody kind of came together, right? And yeah. everybody was hurting. Everybody was sad. Everybody was crying. And then they did the 24 second violation to represent his number 24 and the eight second violation to remember the number he wore his first half of his career. And everybody started chanting Kobe and Gigi. It was beautiful. It gave me so much hope for people it gave me so yeah. much hope for humanity. It was, it was a beautiful, but sad night, man. Uh, but this has been a real beautiful chat, man. Tony, I really appreciate your time. Uh, yeah, like I yeah. said, you guys have the best podcast in animation. And if you guys like this one, you're going to love Tom and Tony's, man. He's been Tony. I've been Julian. This has been the What's in My Head podcast, and this has been another piece of your childhood. Good night. My guest next week is one of my favorite storyboard artists of all time, Mr. Brian Andrews. Enjoy the teaser. You know, Gindy was wanted to really make sure we didn't go nuts with the blood just because we could. You know, I think I was probably pushing it a little bit more. He, they probably would love to say this, like all I wanted was blood. That's technically not true. I just when it when that one when he kills that one daughter of a coup, and the blood, it needs to be a shocking moment. Yeah. So I just pushed it. Like I went like old school samurai movie. When he cuts it, it just goes like sprays along yeah. the wall, and we linger on her for a while as she like. Uh, and then exactly. goes and, and we can see the blood just starting to just slowly drip on the wall then you cut you see here the deck and then the blood is spilling out over the stuff he was just like it just goes on too long dude <laughs> let's pull it back let's save it for the pooling that's all we, we just need to see it fly and we go oh, blood for the first time and then it hits and then we see it pool and it's like okay but at least he didn't take out the other stuff because then you know he's got he's he's wounded and the shots of his hand along the wall and stuff yeah. like that and leaving the blood trail that all that stuff was very important to me so all he did was just make sure that this mega shogun assassin style spray because i love those old lone wolf and cub 70s movies it's like we watched that shit to death back in the, when we were young and we fucking love it so that was almost like an homage to that but it was just a little too much at that moment for Gendy. so he, he pulled that thing back and it's cool 
but um there's so much in there that we finally were able to do that we were just chomping at the bit all the time to like do you know it's like so cool <laughs>